afternoon or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're tuning in from. Welcome to the Horasis India meeting 2021, coming to you online as a concession to the extraordinary times we are living in. I trust everyone who is tuned in today is fully vaccinated or will soon be, and that you're all observing safety protocols. Allow me to briefly introduce myself. I'm Venki Vembu. I'm a journalist. I'm currently based in India, and it is my pleasure and privilege to moderate this morning's panel discussion on the new circular economy goals developing in India. I have with me three distinguished panelists. There's a fourth one expected to join us, but we'll, we'll give him a little bit more time. These, four, these three panelists are actively engaged in the space of circular economy in various domains and who they bring a wide national perspective to the challenges on this journey and who have been given some, they have given, been given some thought to framing solutions to these problems. I will introduce them very briefly in just a minute. Uh, but I'd like to take a couple of minutes to trace the contours of the discussion we hope to have. India has a compelling need to grow its economy in top gear in order to lift up the economic standard of living of millions of its citizens. But the traditional energy and resource intensive models of economic growth, which brought immense prosperity to millions in India and around the world, are close to their use by date. The consequences of excessive energy and resource use in pursuit of supernormal growth are already beginning to manifest themselves. The reality of climate change has wrought drastic changes in weather patterns. Just this past week, we've seen cataclysmic images of intense flooding in the western Indian state of Maharashtra, a little further away in Zhengzhou in China, and in Germany as well. It is in this context that the framing of the developmental discourse around the compulsions of a circular economy, the topic of today's discussion, acquires significance. Very briefly, a circular economy revolves around a system that is based on restorative and regenerative principles. It represents a defining change from the older model of take, make, waste by emphasizing the so-called five R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, reproduce, and refurbish. For this vision of a circular economy to be realized, however, new business models need to be framed, which will require appropriate technologies and financial innovations. India has taken some baby steps in the direction of getting a circular economy off the ground, but of course, much more remains to be done if the broader goals are to be realized by 2025. How can it achieve the goal of a fully circular economy? How can change be catalyzed? To help us think through these questions, we have with us these panelists of distinction, each of whom brings a unique experience to bear. In no particular order, they are Mr. Sunday Adyojo, co-founder of Bio Drive to Energy, which offers waste management solutions. Mr. Adyojo, if you could please wave to the audience. Thank you. Mr. Adyojo is currently in Zurich and it's very early in the morning for him. We greatly appreciate your forsaking an hour of your sleep and making the extra effort in the course of a circular economy. We are expecting another panelist from Bombay, Mr. Bala Sahab Dorati. Otherwise, when he comes in, I'll introduce you. Next, we have Ms. Bonnie Liao, who comes to us from Hong Kong. Bonnie, if you could please wave. Ms. Liao is Executive Director and Founding Member of Social Enterprises Research Academy. The Academy is involved in environmental, social and governance training and research and helps corporates implement ESG management systems to better facilitate uh, stakeholders in creating values. We are particularly eager to hear Bonnie's thoughts on India's transition to a circular plastics economy. Our next panelist is Mr. Ulhas Nimkar, Chairman and Managing Director, Nimkar Tech Technical Services. Ulhas too is currently in Mumbai, where there's been severe flooding as we've seen. We wish him well. Nimka Tech is a textile and chemical testing laboratory, which additionally offers training and consultancy in chemical management to the textile, apparel, and the chemicals industries, particularly in the area of environmental issues and sustainability. Ulhas is personally committed to controlling hazardous chemicals in the supply chain, and we look forward to having, hearing from him. Welcome to all of you. It's my pleasure to have you on this panel, and I look forward to a lively discussion. I will now call upon each of the panelists to make their opening statement on the topic. Mr. Adyoju, Sunday, Sunday, could you please give us a background to your work and your company's work in the space, the geography it operates in, and so on? Yes. Sunday, you have the, the floor is yours. Yes. I will say thank you very much for giving me this great opportunity to be part of this panel. 
actually uh, I could not sleep very well because I have to be watching the time <laughs> but I'm so glad I made it also and I'm so happy to see all of you here live and um, let me go straight off to to the point bio dry to energy is based in London and we're also working around the globe especially most especially in some part of the African countries and our main duty is just to help the society, I would say the society, I would say the world, to reduce this big problem we have been facing, which is waste. Waste is a very, I would say, reputable uh, sources. And that is uh, actually, I would say, it's gold when we use it in the right times, when we use it in the right way. But the problem we are facing around the world is... Uh, lack of experience <clears throat> which is which is very very dangerous i would say because when we talk about waste waste is so so dangerous to our community to our own selves and this is what we have been experiencing in these sectors because we we don't we we we, we don't educate people actually on how to deal with this waste and that is one of the biggest problem we are facing around the world around the globe and this is why BioDry is also here with other companies, with other uh, institutions to help our environment get hold of this, I would say, stubborn, stubborn, <laughs> stubborn uh, stuff. And BioDry to energy transform waste into valuable resources, I would say, such as raw materials. We also use them for cement, which is very, very important. Like many other companies around the globe who are using also waste, we use at least 22% of our waste for, for cement, which is very, very important. We can say cement is one of the, if actually the one of the most sinable thing on earth, because everywhere you go, you have a block, you have the road. So cement is more valuable, very valuable, water is the number one then i will tell you cement is the second thing on this planet because wherever you go wherever you are you see this waste stuff everywhere so we we decided to to bring up this technology of using this waste that that means we cooperate with recycling company there are a lot of recycling recycling companies out there there are a lot of factories also using our waste to produce also books, books, instead of cutting all those trees, environment, we're trying to do something for the environment, which is very vital. It's very, very vital on how we manage our waste. And we are trying to help cities, towns, town planners to come together. And we sit down together and draw up a line and say, this is actually how we can work together. This is actually how we can do this together in order to reduce waste, create also jobs in all those areas that were involved and also try to bring, we call them the waste police. Why do we call them the waste police? We try to develop a name that will be suitable so that people around there, outside there, will not just look at these waste workers as just an ordinary element, as just an ordinary people outside there doing the rubbish garbage or doing the rubbish work. So we call them the waste police. And we try to make sure that they are well dressed, well dressed when they go, equipped with the modern, uh, what do you call it, garbage like a uh, laptop or whatsoever, so that they go around the community teaching the people how to live with waste in a very, in a very sound manner. And that is my own short information for, 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 for BioDrive. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Sunday. We'll delve a little deeper into the work that you do in just a little bit. I would now like to turn to uh, Ms. Bonnie Leo. Bonnie, you tell us about the good work that you do. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Bonnie Leo, the founding member and executive director of Social Enterprise Research Academy. And I'm glad to be joining you all from Hong Kong today to discuss on this meaningful topic, the new circling coming goals developing in, in India. Social Enterprise Research Academy that we were uh, establishing uh, was actually founded in 2014. And we have the mission statement of harness the market to bring social caring. 
we aim to foster and to create a cross-sectoral platform with business, academia, social and political sectors to foster the communications and together the sustainability elites from different industries into our one par unparalleled high-value networking platform and to foster social responsibility and sustainable development in Asian communities. So over the years, we have united more than 10,000 new business leaders and organizations for hosting international summits with world-class speakers, and our presence is already extending to 13 cities through our fellowship program. We're very dedicated in the continual social responsibility, development, and promotion application of our social caring pledge framework and has six principles that are based on SDG goals and to broaden the international perspective of industry leaders to affect our society. Since we're one of the service provider um, of the United Nations principles of responsible investment, uh, which is called the UN Paralysis 2015, we have been researching, promoting ESG, standing for Environmenting, environmental, social, and corporate governance issues into the mainstream investment decision making and ownership. So, under a huge impact of the COVID 19 pandemic, we have been customizing our research and offline teaching materials, training materials to meet the huge demand of ESG professionals worldwide through our unique online training program. Our, it was just called the Certified ESG Leader Program, and uh, this CESGL program provides profound knowledge to help CEOs and senior management to establish their own ESG management system, auditing and reporting in their companies. So after successful completing the program, then we will have this uh, destination for these ESG leaders for professional purposes. And in fact, more and more thought exchanges around the world are requiring ESG reporting to promote sustainability. But then uh, there's a need for development and implementation and maintenance for a ESG management system to improve the sustainable performance rather than just reporting. So in today's topic, I think that we could also look into how ESG management system could be contributing to the achievement of a new circular economy. Based on the topic called the uh, based on the topic of plastic industry, so th I hope to share with you more on this uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bonnie. We'll circle back in just a bit. Ulhas, I'm given to understand that your company does great work in the area of textile and chemical testing, and that you have very strong views on the matter. Let's hear them. Well, thank you very much. Well, Nimka Tech has been uh, around for uh, over twelve years now but before that i have been in this business for almost now 35 years so we offer services to various industries across the world which include brands and retailers the chemical suppliers then we have the trims and accessories dye houses process houses right across the value chains of leather textile and footwear now in all these sectors put together you may be surprised to note that more than 8000 chemicals are used now, over the years, people have realized that many of these chemicals are not necessarily safe. And since the last 20, 25 years, many chemicals have been classified to be harmful to human health or harmful to the environment. And it's necessary that uh, the industry understand how to regulate these, how to control these right from their raw material to their end products. So we offer two services. One is the analytical service from the laboratory where we analyze these at various stages, right from input to process to end article, including waste that goes eventually into wastewater or air emissions or sludge and so on. And along with that, uh, we also go backward to train these companies. Because if we have to implement something, the first thing is good understanding. In the early years, of course, for the 20, 25 years, we did this in person where we could travel. But we didn't wait for the pandemic. We started an online course, training course, almost way back in 2012. Because we realized that it was not possible that in 30, 40 countries that we can find subject matter experts who can explain this. So we have already been in this training, uh, online training, as I said, from the last six or seven years. And since the last two years, of course, this has uh, really been a big boon because uh, it has now become a necessity. 
So I think over the years, we've probably reached out to more than 10,000 learners in over 60 countries and in multiple languages. So we have our training programs, of course, in English, but in Italian, in Latin, Spanish, and a few modules in Chinese as well. With respect to today's topic on circular economy, there is no doubt that this is a need. And this is our latest uh, finding that as more and more brands come into circular economy, there is very little understanding of the chemicals that will be carried forward from earlier processes into the raw materials. And this is going to be a new learning as we go along. Well, more in the next session as we go ahead, but this is a brief idea of what we do now. Thank you for that, Ulhas. We'll dig a little deeper, like you say, in just in the, during the next round. I'd like to open up the discussion by asking the panelists about the challenges that they see in achieving the goals of a circular economy. In doing that, please draw from your international experience. And if you have any India-specific perspective to share, we'd be happy to hear them. Where, do you, the, where does the problem lie? It's, is it in the policy space? Is it in the way policy is implemented? Or, or is there a problem in the lack of an efficient market? Uh, happy to hear. Bonnie, would you like to go first? I know that your academy is in the business of offering solutions, but could you first identify the challenges? I know that India has signed a global accord on banning wastage of plastics, but is that good enough? How will India go about eliminating plastic toys and wrappings? Yes. So in today's discussion, we're going to look at how circular economy measures or models can actually retain the added value for use as long as long as long as possible and reducing waste and keeping the value of plastics in our economy without harming our environment. In the report, this called Circular Economy Roadmap for Plastics in India, prepared by the Energy Resources Institute in 2021, which is renewed, it strongly emphasizes that in order to achieve the transition of circular plastic economy in India, it requires extensive financial and regulatory linkages between stakeholders who are the regulators, the policymakers, the corporates, and the financial institutions supported by innovative technology and financial solutions. And why would the reports be suggesting extensive financial and regulatory linkages? Looking from the regulatory wise, the government of India through its plastic waste management rules in 2020 and in 2016 has mandated and is called extended producer responsibility, the EPR that incorporates circularity by, manu by making manufacturers of the products responsible for collecting uh, and processing the products upon the end of their lifetime. And the objective of a EPR is to minimize the total environmental impact from a product and to encourage manufacturers to take responsibility and to create markets for the use. But the policy pushed towards the resource efficiency and circular economy in plastic is relatively new and lack a systematic approach. So specifically, there, there is not much emphasizing on um, unlocking the market potential of the secondary plastic and is lacking of strict enforcement of waste collection, then the EPR implementation is more like a CSR initiative, like open dumping or clogging of drains with plastic waste due to prevalence and segregation of waste at source and segregated collection, especially in rural areas, is still non-existent. So the reason behind this unorganized and informal mechanical recycling, regardless of the policy in place, is financially not well linked. Why is it? Because there's a lack of investment and funding to set up proper waste management infrastructure, including operational costs such as transporting waste for reprocessing. Chemical recycling requires large investments, and there's a lack of market-based instrument or regulatory measures for effective functioning of business models. And for economically speaking, the challenges to set up a standard prices of plastic waste as raw materials and market for recycled products is also existing. So the key question is, how can we make the policy makers, environmental regulators, and financial markets to redirect the capital flow from public-private non-profit sectors to finance for the environmental sustainability and circular economy initiatives. So the answer is green financing. Green financing is to increase the proportionate transformative investment to sector level to meet the country's climate goals. And especially with a slowdown created by the COVID-19 recently, the government has to find new ways and alternative ways to incentivize private sector's participation to scale up investment for a sustainable and transformational impact. Therefore, I think identifying and analyzing key source of finance, the instrument used for mobilize, fund, 
ultimate beneficiaries become crucial for diamonds and planning and monitoring the green investment in the country. But, however, in the landscape of green finance in India, undertaken like by the Climate Policy Initiative, pinpoint their barriers and clearly measuring the green finance flows in India, such as for for the disbursement of funds at multiple levels within the value chain, they have their data is actually non-available. And this data actually non-standardized reporting due to a lack of harmonized green finance taxonomy, uh, taxonomy in the country. And there's a large variations uh, in the granularity and format and the categorization of data at the state level. So uh, as, especially when there's an absence of climate-related financial disclosure policy in the country, then the, there's this issue on the data confidentiality as well. So uh, in later parts, I would like to explain more on the how can we actually resolve this issue so that we can have a better capital redirection to uh, facilitate this circular economy. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bonnie. You, you, you've raised a whole lot of points there. Ulhas, uh, you've addressed a UN body in 2015 and you're on record as saying that there are formidable challenges in the space that you operate in. Can you let us in on some of these challenges? Um, well, okay, let's take a look at how the world is today. Just 200 years ago, in the year 1800, our population was 1 billion. Today, we are already 7.5 billion in just 200 years. Combined with that, majority of the innovations that we see today on the planet are only from the last 100 years. As an example, the first synthetic chemical ever made was only in 1856, so it's only 160 years. And all the clothes that we wear, we are synthetic. You have nylon, polyester, acrylic, polypropylene. All these are inventions from the 30s, 40s, 50s. So we are now talking about something which is only 60, 70 years ago. Thereafter, there were so many functional chemicals and others that were developed in 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on. And all these now, if we look at the population today, the consumption at 7 kilograms per person, which means we are consuming clothes equivalent to 50 billion kilograms per year on planet Earth. That means 50 billion kilograms have to go to some end application, either recycled or landfill. Now, if you look at the current report that was generated by, uh, it was the Ellen MacArthur report, it says in true circularity terms, less than 1% of clothes are recycled more than 70% of clothes go to landfill and the remaining find some other application may be reused as a raw material. Now, this is something that has to change. So some years back, of course, with plastic recycling, it started with PET bottles. And that is a relatively clean technology because drinking water bottles water bottles and then either mechanically recycling them or chemically recycling them uh, has been a very successful enterprise and it's been going on. Even in India, we have a large factory over here and I think about 12 million tons is what they are doing annually, uh, recycling polyester pet bottles. But when we come to clothes, that's a big challenge because there are two things. First, a clothing article is not a single fiber. It's a complex article because you might have more than four or five types of fabrics. You will have different types of materials. You may have buttons, beads, plastic inner lining, sewing thread, you might have lycra to give it the kind of feel. So it's an extremely complex article. It's not something that can be easily recycled. Whereas if you look at all the global brands, almost every single brand has gone and made a global public commitment. They will recycle X percentage reaching to 100% in the next coming year, Some, somebody by 2025, by 2030 and so on. Now, this is going to be a big challenge. It's one thing to say and give a commitment, but how are they going to really achieve this is a question. You know, selling secondhand clothes is one of the things that they have addressed, and but that's not a circular economy. It has to come back. So a T-shirt has to become a T-shirt again. That is the real thing. And as they have started experimenting with taking recycling, let's say from ocean plastic and so on, it has posed with new challenges. We had a case where a worker, a set of workers developed an allergic reaction all over the body on while they were handling something like this. And eventually when it was traced back, they even identified the chemical that came into this. But who knows where it came from? We have no clue because this ocean plastic is just collected waste. 
Now, these are the kind of challenges that will come. So I think globally, it's, there's going to be a need to find a strategy, find a criteria and perhaps harmonize a process so that whatever everyone does is more or less on similar lines. So we are not running helter skelter, you know, across. So apart from this is a big challenge that you asked me what I talked about in uh, Nigeria, uh, in Kenya at Nairobi during this UNEP. Sorry about that. <laughs> so the disintegration of clothes is going to happen in unsecured landfills. Because when we are doing textile waste effluent treatment, we are having very complex reactions and the sludge that is generated goes to very secure landfills and so on. But clothes that are lying in unsecured landfills, they will degrade under light, they will degrade under heat, they will degrade under all kinds of aerobic, anaerobic and all other conditions. And in the next rainfall, all these degraded chemicals are going to the same water bodies that will be the, the soil, the river or the ocean nearby. Now, how this will be addressed is going to be a big challenge. And this is where at the UN level, I think everybody on, you know, knowledgeable in this or universities, research organizations, NGOs need to come forward to address an issue like this. This is a, this is the challenge, certainly. Thank you for Ulhas for that you know, historical and uh, global perspective that you gave. Sunday, uh, can you give us an outside in view of India from your perch in Zurich? Would you be willing to share your experience of trying to get a foothold in India? More generally, what are the challenges in the space that you see? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I go into my own personal uh, diary here, I would like to touch base with uh, what my two final finalists said before. Yes, we made mention of the chemical, which is which is really rigorous chemical aspect. You talk of the uh, textile uh, part also, which is also a huge stuff in, 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 in our environment. Now the differences between Africa and Europe is very huge and uh, the difference between Africa and, uh, and America is also very huge. I can say uh, to India, maybe it's sli slightly uh, 30, 30 to 50%, something like that. The difference is really huge when you are talking about the, the recycled materials we put on our body, which is uh, uh, the difference as an African living here in Europe. I saw the difference. The difference is really, really huge. There in Africa, we manage our, what, whatever we put on our body, we manage it better than the Europeans, than the, better than the Americans, because we have to take care. I think in Indian is also almost like Africa, maybe a bit better. We have to, we don't recycle our clothes like that. We just try to make sure that everything is touched together, put together. They reduce a lot, a huge large of, uh, uh, of waste where you produce here in Europe. In Europe here, sometimes I shoot my head when I see what people are throwing up the garbage there. In Africa, we can do that. We have to make sure that everything is touched together again. We try to fix everything together. I think, I think you know better. Than me they, than that you know because it's your sector so uh, you see i purposely put this on today because what we do is we, we just try to make sure that what we have on our body when it's not fitting again we try to patch it we try to put it together not because they are trying to manage the waste is because of the economic system also because they lack the fun that is one of the huge problems that is in this world the gap is very very big the gap is very, very big. And through this, what we put on our body, there's a huge storm of garbage that are just flowing there. Sometimes I go to the beach here. I saw sometimes people throwing away their pants, throwing away their trousers just because they don't want it again. In Africa, you will learn how to give to order. You pass it to the next person if you don't want it again. And that is a way how you reduce waste. And you're talking about the chemical uh, sectors which you said uh, requires uh, a huge sum of money. Most of the co companies I knew, they are sinking in the water because they cannot manage their company again because of the fund. They don't have the fund. And this is one of the things I think the government should rethink here, try to build up a system whereby you can stretch out your hand and embark on this company, these little companies that don't have the funds to help them set up something that will help them to manage 
this their chemical it's it's really huge it's a big problem also in the recycling sectors when you see the workers they are afraid afraid in terms of covid anyway they are they are more afraid because you don't actually know what kind of chemicals you are touching we are doing there it, it's it's a huge problem in recycling sectors which you guys knows and that is one thing i think the government should rethink try to set up i don't say a, a crowd home at least give a loan out to such those companies that need mm. this urgently and try to minimize the return so that they can also afford to pay back because they are dying most of them are closing up most of them cannot afford to 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 to, to live again they are choked choked they are choked and that is one of the problem i see here mm. in europe in africa is a bit different because the people are they don't have this uh, recycling system we have here. they just go and pump the whole thing in a place very huge and what how do they recycle they put fire they put fire every day they reduce the garbage i saw it with my eyes people there one of the workers i saw in sierra Leone when i visited sierra Leone to talk to the president of the sierra Leone about how to help them on the recycling sector is when I was at the recycling center, sorry to say this, I have to say this, it's very, very important. I was shocked. It's a huge mountain of garbage and the workers there, they work without uh, all these facilities we have here, you know, and they, they, the way they reduce the waste or they manage their waste is just put on the fire, it reduces it. Is, and when the trucks comes again, it pours the, the garbage there, they put on the fire, it reduces carbon they don't have the they don't have the clean uh, air we breathe here no way so their their throat their lungs is already contaminated and this is one of the because the united nation according to my to my finding the united nation have uh, i think according to my finding they have uh, 17 sustainable development goals 17 and out of those 17 i believe both of you have touched two or three of them two or three of them you have touched you have touched the water sectors you have talked they uh, touched the 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 uh the uh, what do you call it you have touched the 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 waste sectors also and you have touched the chemical sectors which are very rigorous and that is a big big problem now let me go back to 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 the challenges that we are facing in short I would say the challenge is facing the circular economy across our business or across our city. I will re reduce it to, 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 to this line. By keeping, uh, by keeping the materials in use as long as possible. That is why I brought up the example. By keeping them, we have to use it as long as possible. By so doing, we reduce, we reduce or we help to manage the waste outside there it requires a lot of discipline and the discipline starts at home because we produce most of this uh, waste right from our kitchen right from our kitchen i saw here in europe when things are not fixing together just a little they throw it away we should try to manage to sometimes maybe take your knife try to take on some part of it it's like re you recycle there already you are doing recycling and then you try at least to okay when you have huge when you have enough then you don't have the problem of taking care of the garbages in your own kitchen which is a, a bit different from africa and indian as i as i as i believe we, we we just try also in the kitchen to eat a potato that is somehow maybe two three days older and then we just try to scrape it and then try to make the best out of that here they throw it away so people don't have discipline of managing their kitchen and if you cannot manage your kitchen definitely you cannot manage your, your other stuffs like clothes like shoes you they don't we have to learn how to give to the others by giving to others you also recycle you help the world you help the united nation we help ourselves to live in an environment where we have give and take share with each other and that's one of the biggest problems and by doing all this we help also our environment to, to to live in a very clean environment which is very very vital in this world we are living now
because when Sorry. you look around now with the mask some people they don't have the discipline of putting the marks in the dustbin they just throw it away they throw it away and i saw people when they go they try to avoid going over the mask you know this is also bringing fears into our community bringing fears into our own personal life which has not been there before so we just have to try to manage how we live in this world we are living today with our waste clever well, i would say clever we have to be very clever to do this thank you thank you for that impassioned and very uh, anecdotal uh, narrative because as an indian i can relate to many of the things that you said we you know there's a we maximize the lifespan of everything that we use so thank you for that uh, now that we've sort of identified the challenges let's look a bit ahead and figure out the nature of the solutions to the problems in achieving the goals of a fully circular economy do the solutions lie in the realm of technology or policy action or in stricter implementation what kind of incentives are needed to enforce a behavioral shift given your international perspective each of your panelists i'm keen to know about your experience of other countries particularly the success stories are these models replicable in india what lessons can india take from these three countries uh, quickly just a, three minutes for each of but if you bonnie do you want to like to go first sure what? sure um okay let me let me let me uh, just have a very quick and brief uh, um uh, uh, talk on the key points for actually the solutions i think first we have in order to achieve the circular economy where india needs to have an integrated domestic measurement reporting and verification system which is called mrv which is similar to esg system just streamline the green finance attributes identify the financial constraints and then enhance the trans Embarrassing. A comprehensive climate budget tagging framework should be developed to track the climate related expenditure in the national budget system and to take advantage of the already mainstreamed climate action through policy formulation and to help further mainstreaming. And to achieve it, we need to have law and regulations. And similar to other global stock exchange markets regulations, we have to disclose reports with taxonomy. Uh, that have uh, definitions and indicators, the KPIs, so that we can do benchmarking and monitoring to foster the transformation process. And in India, in India, there's a taxonomy regulation that can establish environmental objectives, which I can uh, name a few, such as facing on certain types of plastic, the ban on certain single use of plastic products, waste reduction targets, recycling contents for tea products, and expanding the use of bio-based. And compostable materials, etc. But most important, I think, we have to set up an independent rating agency, which is to resolve and rectify the current data granularity issue, which I mentioned just now. That、uh, most of the data are not available and not standardized, so we cannot do a consolidated,、uh, you know,、uh, data management thing to review what's going on and what to improve. So this is very important for monitoring、uh, the whole process. And because in India,、uh, the public sector undertaking, the PSUs we call it, plays a very important role in mobilizing the increasing green capital flows. So I think that we have to、um, use more PSUs、uh, for which are the important channels for、uh, dispersing funds from the central state government, for markets, and the international development agency that will operate a critical source of green finance. So by using utilizing this as a, a policy approach. With enhanced responsibility for each PSU, I think we can actually help to adjust the mandate and leverage on the on the current situation and enhance the private sector participation. So,、um, more more or less, it would be、uh, on what、uh, my views and suggestions for enhancing the、uh, the green finance and the capital、uh, redirection、uh, to the sustainable circular economy. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bonnie. Uh, Ulhas, you did a good job of、uh, highlighting the challenges, and there are、uh, many, as you can see.、Uh, you know, now give us. Would you like to give us to, something to end this discussion on a happy note? Where might the solutions come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, solutions have already been looked at, as you can imagine, for the last couple of decades, and ultimately, the perfect solution would be a hundred percent circular economy someday. For that, you will need technology, systems, legislation. Everything will be required, and collaboration from all stakeholders. What industry started with is first, of course, try and extend the life. And I could very well relate to what Sunday said: is that in countries like ours, we first try and use it till it's absolutely shredded, and we don't throw away anything. 
and if we see the amount of clothing at the extreme two ends in africa there are many countries who le use less than 1 kg per year and at the other end they use more than 27 kg per year in many western countries so there is a lot of things that need to be reused and recycled so now if we check what else industry has done so they started finding first newer applications for example, you could shred cotton, you could shred denim jeans and then use those fibers for reinforcing and making some things uh, as another, uh, let's say, a raw material for another article. For example, in Germany, I had the chance to visit a factory that made the inner panels of the uh, automobiles using shredded denim and making uh, molds out of it. But it is not true circular economy. You can use it for insulating material, you can use fibers for making rag rugs. Perhaps you will be astonished to note that hundreds of 40 feet containers come to India every, every week, I am told, at Kandla only for recycling. So we have been the recycling capital of the world for the last, I think, several decades. And what they do over there, they sort out those clothes into different colors, into different fibers. All the woolen articles go to making shoddy blankets, they make uh, carpets, they make uh, other end applications. The cellulosic and other fibers go to making rag rugs, then they go to make... Oh. So all kinds of materials are made out of this. And eventually what cannot be used, of course, unfortunately goes for incineration or has to go, for, go to landfills. Now, several technologies are being explored all around the world. Unfortunately, Complete recycling of clothing is perhaps a few a few years away because there are many technologies at lab scale level, but not everything uh, is easily possible. I think the real thing that has started now is design schools have started explaining people that when you have a consumer product mm -hmm. uh, which needs to be recycled at the end of life, then it has to start with design, understanding the materials, understanding the end of life of each and how it would be really entering the circular economy. I think the solutions, you can sort of see some light at the end of the tunnel because you can see people are really taking efforts. First of all, it's in common discussion. And I think one of the things that has started is that many NGOs have started educating consumers. And once consumers start demanding, I think the whole process will accelerate really, really quickly. Change starts from the bottom. Thank you for that, Ulhas. Sunday, uh, you've laid out the sociological nature of the problem. Does technology offer a way a way out of the of the crisis? Do you, do you think technology in the, in the area of waste management does technology have any role to play in finding a solution? Two minutes. Yes, uh, I, I will use one minute because I love hearing both of them. They are really really <laughs> good. I'm learning from them. <laughs> As we are all. Yeah. Yes, I, I would just call it simple. Simple. The solution here lies in what both of them have said before. It's very, very simple to work together with each other. And we have to apply the three principles of circular economy, which you have made mention. The three circular economy to reduce, to reduce, to recycle all, or maybe at, at, at least all, and to preserve our ecosystem. So they've, they've said everything. They've said everything. That's why. I'm, I'm short of words now here because uh, that is what we need to keep moving. That is all what we keep to moving. Thank you. Thank you for that. We are, uh, we are coming to a hard stop in just a minute. So I'll just close by thanking each one of our panelists, uh, Bonnie, uh, Sunday and Ulhas for the rich perspective that you brought to bear. I take note of all your observations that well, there are many challenges on India's path to a circular economy. The solutions perhaps lie at the intersection of technology and innovation and the right policy action and implemented rigorously in the hope that we will reach that shining city on a hill. And soon, this is I, Venki Vembu, signing off from the Hadassah India meeting 2021. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye for now. Bye.